Hi everybody, my name's Thomas Quinn and this is Undeniable. My guest today is the Toronto radio and music legend, Mr. Alan Cross of the Edge, the Geeks and Beats podcast, author and host of the ongoing history of new music. He has spent almost 40 years on the airwaves and immersed in all things music since the age of six when he received his first radio. We discussed this in the pod, but for me, growing up in small town Ontario, listening to Alan Cross was a respite from the mundane. He brought great music, new wisdom, and just allowed me to fantasize about getting out and seeing the world. So without further ado, Mr. Alan Cross. Thanks for doing this. Well, thank you for being flexible. I've had quite the whirlwind. I've been kind of stalking you online <laughs> since uh, we've been in communication. Yeah, there was a lot of travel, a lot of hospital stays. I've also been following Geeks and Beats. Yeah. You're a lot more uh, candid on that. Well, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You've been, uh, how are you doing physically? I'm fine now. I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've passed uh, through all the stages of surgery and recovery, so I should be fine. So you recently got back from California where you were testing the waters as an influencer. Yeah. How is it? Do you think you'll do more in the future? I don't know. Uh, that was a really interesting opportunity. Nobody had ever asked me to do anything like that before. And I'm not in sure, I'm not entirely sure what the people who engage me would consider to be successful. I haven't heard back from them. Um, but if they want me to do more, I'd be open to it because it's a whole new world. I was talking to all the other influencers that were down there. And these are people with Instagram accounts with 215, 250,000 followers. And this is all they do is determine exactly the, the, uh, they approach a brand and then work on somehow amplifying the brand's message. It's a whole new world to me. I don't even, don't even understand, but I want to get deeper into it so I can figure out what's actually going on. Yeah, my wife is a makeup artist, and recently she asked someone, am I supposed to wait for them to come to me, or should I just approach some companies? And uh, they're like, just approach the companies you like, and then next week we have boxes of makeup just showing no up kidding. at our house. Yeah, she's, I mean, she's, she's really good at what she does, so I, I get it. I didn't understand why they would want me. But okay, fine. I'll give it a shot. But then you know the podcast, and you were mentioning on Geeks and Beats. I don't obviously, I guess not on like ongoing history, but it's uh, it's a new world, really. <laughs> yeah, and people are still trying to figure their way around it. Um, there was one woman who makes a living being an influencer. Uh, I guess the real problem was that she, you know, she's always got to be on. She's always got to be chasing business, and you're always got to be chasing money from the things that she does. And then at the same time, she has to educate all the people that are employing her services, explaining, you know, what they're actually getting for what they pay for. Mm. So it's it's something that I plan to really get into in 2020. Yeah, because it seems a lot different. For example, like a code you put in on your podcast at New Music or something mm. where they can actually see, okay, this listener bought this service on a website where it's very easily tracked. Whereas if you're just offering, like, I was here... <laughs> yeah, and my 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 question, my my answer to that would be big deal. Yeah. Uh, but and now with Instagram talking about not publishing likes anymore. Yeah, I mean, how do you measure things if you don't see exactly how many likes you get? Or maybe that's just the public side of it. From what I've heard, because I've also been following that, it's uh, on your side. You still get your metrics. There's the skeptics out there, who I am probably one of, who say that it's more of a, a way for them to try and rein in the person to company angle and try and funnel them through Instagram, mm. then to the person as opposed to the, you know. The oh, company. yeah, that makes sense. That's something Facebook would do. Where's their cut? Well, that's it. That's it. Here's the tool. Uh, we provided the tool. The tool is free. Uh, maybe we should think about a of uh, think of a way of of getting a piece of the action. And then, what better way than like, oh, we're trying to help out self esteem and yeah, whatever. <laughs> Please, if that were the case, Facebook would shut down. Yes, especially in this climate, these elections and all that. You are the most notable of the people I've talked to so far. I, I was actually talking to my good buddy. Oh, he's a fucking legend. <laughs> 
because uh, for people like me who grew up before the internet in a small town Ontario, like The Edge, Your Voice, Ongoing History of New Music. I remember uh, you did, I believe, a two-parter or a three-parter on Rage Against Machine back in like 99. Sounds about right. And they were my favorite band. And just to hear not only the like formation of the band, but just to hear multiple songs in one half hour was, was mind-blowing. I literally had to do like, you know, the old setup where you get the... With the uh, rabbit ears yeah, or the, the antenna. Rabbit ears, or... and then you hook it up and then you might undo like a coat hanger. And You grew up in uh, Stonewall? Yeah, small town north of Winnipeg. Uh, when I was there, population about 2,500, 3,000 people. It was so small, my dad was the mayor for a while. Yeah, I read that today. That, that must have been something. That uh, was. We would get interesting phone calls in the middle of the night about the neighbor's dog barking, and would the mayor please come and stop it? <laughs> and, and my dad would get occasional death threats over a, a variety of things that were happening in the community. So it was always a, always a jumping sort of thing for a part-time job where I think he was paid $250 a month. Brothers and sisters? I got a sister. Uh, <laughs> she works for Just the uh, Skip the Dishes now. Oh, okay. In Winnipeg. Uh, I have, uh, she has a son, a nephew, and um, that's about all. Mom and dad, <laughs> and my sister and me. How long did you stay in this small town, Stonewall? Well, I was there. Uh, okay, I grew up there. I then, well, let's back up. Everything that's tied to where I lived has, has to do with the radio. Okay. So when I was six years old, my grandmother gave me a transistor radio for my birthday. And I had no idea why she gave me one. She just did. But I got this Lloyd's transistor radio. And growing up where I was, we had three TV channels, mm -hmm. one of which was in French. And the only radio I knew anything about was what I heard from the radio on the kitchen counter and from the car when mom and dad were driving us around. But with this radio, I suddenly got control of the information coming into the house. I could listen to whatever I wanted. I realized that not only were there more radio stations in Winnipeg than just the one that mom and dad listened to, but there were radio stations all over Canada and the United States that I could now draw in at night. Um, AM radio stations travel very, very far on cold winter evenings. So I would listen to stations from Minneapolis and Chicago and Cincinnati and Denver and Louisville and, and so on. And I realized that this is something I want to do. I want to be part of these voices, this entertainment, this information coming from somewhere. At six? At six. Wow. I would actually fall asleep with my radio on my pillow. And mom would have to come and, and take the pillow away. I asked for bigger radios as I got older. I got a few for Christmas. Uh, and eventually what happened was I, my, we went to my uncle's place to get pick up a brand new puppy. And my uncle was working for the Manitoba telephone system, but on the side, he was servicing jukeboxes. So every two weeks, he would go to all the jukeboxes on his route and swap out old records for new. Oh, okay. And that day, he had a big box of old, worn-out 45s from his jukeboxes, and he couldn't do anything with them. So he gave them to me, and that became the basis of my music collection. And what are we talking? What kind of albums? Uh, uh, singles. All singles. Uh, there's. Uh, I remember that I went through them all, and I kept 27 of them. The rest were, yeah. you know, pop records, country records, records that I didn't really care about. But I remember there were 27 that I kept, and I still have them someplace. And the one that I remember the most was uh, Golden Earring Radar Love. Don't know why, but that's that's one that sticks out of my head on the, on the Chrysalis label. It was the radio edit, too, so it was a terrible version. From there, I decided that, yes, I wanted to get into broadcasting somehow, but I wanted to be a newsman, an anchor, a journalist, a foreign correspondent, something like that. I didn't want to be, you know, long-haired, dope-smoking guy on the radio playing records. So I went through university where I got my first job, which was Friday mornings from 8.30 to 9.30 on CKUW, which was the closed-circuit university radio station at the University of Winnipeg. And it broadcast to one hallway and one cafeteria. But it didn't really matter because it was my start. At around the same time, a guy from my hometown was planning to open a radio station in the middle of a wheat field <laughs> about 15 miles away. And I harassed him until he decided that, yeah, okay, this kid can, can join up. So I ended up working weekends there. This is in Selkirk, Manitoba, a station called CFQX. And it was an elevator music station. Okay. So for every vocal that you played, every vocal record you played, you had to play two instrumentals. So very sleepy, very dull. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, you know, it was real world radio. 
And not only did I get to do news and sports and weather and that sort of stuff, I got to do a bunch of other things. That lasted until I got out of university. And after that, I ended up getting a full-time job at a 1,000-watt AM radio station in Kenora, Ontario. And that was the first time I moved out of the house. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Kenora with the promise that when the news guy quit, and I was assured he was going to quit, that I would get his job. So for two months, I played records and talked on the radio, and then the guy quit. So I got to be a news person. I achieved my lifelong dream. And you're what, 22? 20, 21? Hang on. I am 20, 21. And I hated it. I hated every single Did second. you have to write it? I had to do everything. I had to go to those council meetings. I had to do the police reports. I had to deliver the news on the air. I had, oh, I hated it. And I, I was having this crisis of confidence until I got a phone call from a guy at a radio station in Brandon, Manitoba, a very cool rock station in Brandon, which had no business having a cool rock station, and wanted to know if I would work out there. Mm -hmm. And I left Kenora so fast that my landlord actually sent the sheriff after me for non-payment of rent. <laughs> so I'm on FM. Yeah. I am playing rock records and talking about rock records on the radio. And I found out that I really kind of like this. Stayed there for nine months. Then I got a job doing all nights in Winnipeg at a station called Q94 FM. And that lasted until I got into a fight with my boss about uh, about two years later. And uh, out of desperation, I applied for a bunch of jobs everywhere across the country. And the only response I got was from CFNY, The Edge. And uh, in October of 86, I started here. So those are my moves. So it was Stonewall to Kenora to Brandon to Winnipeg to Brampton. Wow. What was your taste like growing up? <sighs> Gee, when I was young, we didn't have any cool uh, FM stations. Mm -hmm. None. It was all AM. So there were three, three top 40 stations. And uh, I would buy all the top 40 singles. Uh, I would go up to Irene Pearson's Furniture Store in downtown Stonewall. And every Tuesday, I would order five or six singles from what she had available and go pick them up the following week, at which time I would order more. Yeah. So that's how I began to build my singles collection. Then every once in a while, I would go into Winnipeg with my mom, usually with my sister who was taking music lessons and mom would drop me off at the mall and I would hang out at Sam the Record Man and using whatever money I, I had scraped together to using part-time jobs, I would buy a record or two. And that's how it built up over the years. I know you played the drums. When, when did that start? That started in high school. Uh, we got together I think grade 11-ish. There were four of us and we decided that we needed to form a band. We divided, divided up instruments. Uh, one guy, two guys were already playing guitar, so that was taken. So I ended up with the drums, which was fine with me. Did you guys play shows? We did. We played uh, a few low-key sort of things. Uh, there were a couple of other bands that followed. Uh, nothing earth-shattering, just enough to get some free drinks. I don't think we were ever paid to did play. Did you record anything? No. No. No, no, nothing. Unless you kind of like a, a cassette player in the middle of the room. and Yeah. You know, just, yeah, it's garbage. <laughs> Remember back then, we didn't have the luxury of laptops or, or, or home recording gear. Yeah. You would have to go to a studio to do something. That's expensive. And they're very expensive, and we weren't that good. <laughs> this uh, idea of the furniture shop where you get your records, like that's what I had to do as well, and it seems so quaint. <laughs> yeah, it really does. I would go to Irene Pearson's for the singles, and then there was Robinson's General Store for the albums, and the Rexall Drug Store for the albums. They would have a bin of, of uh, LPs at the front, that would switch up every once in a while. In fact, the very first album I bought with my own money was Elton John's Greatest Hits, Volume 1, and I bought that from, from Robinson's. $4.99. And my mom was outraged that I would spend that much money on something as stupid as a record. Yeah, that's interesting. Were your parents encouraging of this no. path? No. <laughs> no. Um, when I got my first part-time job, uh, the first thing I did was bought myself a new 10-speed bike. And then after that, I started buying stereo equipment, which did not go over well. What about the idea of being a newsman? Oh, that's cute. Yeah, you'll grow out of it. 
they wanted me to be a teacher just like everybody else in the family. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I still get that, actually. Yeah, so do I, <laughs> as a matter of fact. <laughs> but you're so good with uh, kids. Yeah. 38 years later, oh, you're going to be moving back into your basement bedroom soon, aren't you? No. Why don't you try teaching? No. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Parents. <laughs> okay, so you moved to Toronto from Winnipeg. Yeah, I arrived here the same day. In fact, the same moment they stuck the shovel in the ground for the sod turning ceremony of the Sky Dome. Oh, wow. 12 noon, October 3rd, 1986. And you're, well, I guess out in Brampton? Yeah, we were in the uh, strip mall above uh, three different roti shops in Brampton. Rotis are delicious. They are, and they had some really good roti shops. That's a spot. And from what I saw, you were working nights to start? I worked uh, five all nights and Saturday morning, so six days a week, and uh, for $17,500 a year. But I was told, don't worry, you'll be able to make more money on the side. So when? Well, when you're not working, but I'm always working. Well, you'll find time. <laughs> but you met your wife through that. I did. I did. Uh, that was 87 that I met her. Uh, we've been married since 1990, yeah. I was reading a few like old articles today, and uh, one was the two of you in this star, I think, about like the travel section talking about Yeah, it. I uh, think so. She mentioned your mullet. Yes, yes. I had uh, some very long mullet years. Uh, God, I wish I hadn't done that, but it was the thing at the time. In researching this talk, I uh, was going through the history of the Edge or CFNY. It sounded like when you got hired, they were only playing like alternative at night? No, 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 no. No, no, it was a full-on alternative station. Uh, in fact, it was more alternative than anything you can imagine today because outside of a minimal number of rules, all the announcers picked their own music. Oh, wow. And when I got there, uh, the library that we had to choose from had about ten or 12,000 songs. And we had to be familiar with all ten or 12,000. So it was extremely um, radical for its day, even well, even more for today. Sorry to preface that. Uh, I know, especially in the 70s and growing up, like it was the most alternative thing. Yes. It, one of them in North America, I believe. Uh, there was us. There was WLR in Long Island. There was WFNX in Boston and K-Rock in, in uh, Los Angeles and Cities 97 in Minneapolis. Those are the, the big ones. What I was reading, they were saying there was a period of time where they were trying out playing top 40 during the day. Yeah, like that the was late 80s or something like that. That was very, 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 very late 80s, very, very early 90s. And that was because there was a ownership change going on. And the management that was in place at the time wanted to boost ratings so that they would keep their jobs when the new management came in or when, oh. the, when the new ownership came in. And uh, yeah, so there was there was a time when when the station was playing Madonna and New Kids on the Block. It was not a very good time, and it, yeah. it only lasted about nine months. But okay. it was a very difficult time for a lot of us, and it's I'm surprised that the staff survived uh, because we were pretty grumbly about the whole thing, and we weren't necessarily subtle about it. <laughs> From what I was reading, the public wasn't either. either. No, 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 no. The public was the, the diehard fans were absolutely livid. Um, for example, uh, we did a Canada Day thing. I think this was 1990s. A bunch of fans hired a plane to tow a banner over 35,000 people at Molson Park and Barry that read, Bring Back the Spirit of Radio. <laughs> so that is pretty hardcore. There was a guy named Larry that was behind all this. And Larry, you know, he been in the age before the internet. He, he you know, had a mailing list and... and uh, and, and petitions and all kinds of stuff. So it was, eventually, it all worked out. Yeah. And that management team was fired. <laughs> I know in uh, ongoing history, you talk a lot about the rise of SoundScan and how that helped fuel the rise of alternative music mm -hmm. on radio and in, in the culture. Did you find that The Edge wasn't the lone kid anymore? Like well, where there was a lot more yeah. people what happened jumping was, on board? Be before SoundScan gave us an accurate indication of what records were actually selling, we had to kind of go on, on gut and anecdote. And what happened was in March of 91 in the United States, SoundScan came in. SoundScan actually counted the number of physical records that went past the checkout rather than estimates. And... When those numbers started coming in, it turned out that country music was woefully 
underrepresented on the charts because more country records were selling than anybody had ever guessed and more alternative records were selling more than anybody ever guessed. So looking at this, started to realize that, yes, there is a very big market for this sort of music. It's a passionate market. It's a market that spends money and it's a, it's a, um, a market that is, is very, very motivated to do things in and around the music. So that basically changed the way the industry looked at alt rock. It also changed the way the new management looked at CFNY at the time because there was this thinking that CFNY had run out its string. Uh, too much baggage, too many prejudices, too many biases. It just wasn't, it, there was just no fixing it. But then they took a look at some of the research, including the sound scan numbers, and realized that, whoa, wait a second, there is an audience here. Maybe we should stick with this. And so they did. And uh, instead of flipping to country, they decided to uh, lean into it. Lean into it, yes. Yeah. And that's when this station began to evolve. It became it became the edge, which was the thing to do because nobody remembers call letters. You always everybody's got a nickname for the most part. You know, Q one hundred seven is a nickname, not C I L Q. You know, uh, Sportsnet the fan is uh, C J C L. Yeah, Kiss, Verge, and so on. Yeah, and the edge has you know connotations of yeah being on the edge. Yeah. Makes sense. Just uh, going back a bit, Rush wrote a song or about Spirit of the yeah. Radio? The, the way it worked was the slogan of the station back in its early days was the Spirit of Radio, mm -hmm. which was a way of saying, we do things differently, we play music differently, this is the spirit of what radio was meant to be. At the time, this is before we moved to, to the strip mall in Brampton, there was a little yellow house, and it had a tiny, tiny transmitter, and... CFMY came on the air the same time as Q107. And at first, the two stations went head-to-head, -head playing the same sort of music. But Q107 had a much better signal, much more powerful transmitter. So David Marsden, who was in charge at the time, said, okay, we're not going to beat them at that game. What we're going to have to do is set ourselves apart by playing the music that they won't. And that became the foundation of the spirit of radio, the alternative side of things. And the station caught on in a really weird sort of uh, viral way where people were doing, just like what you said earlier, you know, setting up weird antenna arrangements just so they could pull in the station. Because we were in Brampton, and I think the, the transmitter was someplace in the Caledon Hills. And like that, you can turn everyone on to all this new music. That's why it was so special at the time. And then I think it was 1983, I think it was the fall of 1983, or maybe very early 1984, the station got permission to move the transmitter to the CN Tower. And that's where we are today. Uh, and then that's when it really, really exploded. Um, but in 1980, with the Permanent Waves album, Rush knew all about this weird little radio station in Brampton and took the name from the station's slogan and actually asked the station permission, can we call this new song The Spirit of Radio? And if you look in the liner notes of the Permanent Waves album, underneath the lyrics, it'll say something to the effect of, dedicated to the spirit of radio live and well and living in Brampton. They even gave us a Platinum Record Award. Wow. Which I have in my basement now, by the way. <laughs> Another perk of the gig. Yep. At this point, you must be going to a lot of shows. No. Like, no? You no, never? No, no. I've been to as many shows as I want to go to. Um, I used to go to you know, three, four a week, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, basically done with that. The only shows I go to are the ones that I really want to see because I'm not going to go see your band when you're on a 1215 on a Tuesday night. Yeah. I'm just no. not. Uh, I've got my wife, I've got my dogs, I've got things i got to do at home. I just don't have as much time to devote to that sort of thing. But what about when you're young and kind of still oh, cutting yeah. your teeth? Totally. It used to be, in the, in the early days, what we used to do to make extra money is that uh, if the station was presenting a concert, and you volunteered to go and introduce the band from the stage, you get paid 75 bucks. Oh, okay. So I did a lot of those $75 gigs. You know, Stranglers, New Order, Concrete Blondes, The Pogues, Pet Shop Boys, it goes on and on and on. Were they just cutting in or were they already quite large at this point? Uh, somewhere on their way up, yeah. Uh, New Order was big. Yeah. Uh, Stranglers were legendary. Pogues were just weird. Yeah, it, it all depended. I mean, it, it it depended on whether or not anybody would actually allow you on stage, too, because they would have a road manager who would say yes or no as to whether or not a radio DJ could come up on stage and introduce the band. Still do that every once in a while. Not, not that much. The shows back then must have been amazing. 
Yeah, I mean, it was there were there was something every night. Um, there were more venues than there were today, and a lot of the bands that we're talking about were still on their way up or medium sized. So you can get up really close and personal to a lot of these artists. So what venues were you going to at that time? Oh, Horseshoe, uh, Lee's Palace. There was the Alma Combo. Uh, there was the Diamonds, whatever the Phoenix was called back then, and a bunch of little places. The Rivoli, I guess, would be in there. There was the Bamboo, a couple of other places on Queen Street West. There was one with the Big Bop at the corner of Queen and Bathurst. There was a lot. But then, and there were all the dance clubs, the factory and nuts and bolts and RPM and, uh, you know, the, the cool alternative dance clubs. And if it was a Saturday night, we didn't have a, a gig to go to, sometimes we'd hang out there. Wow. That sounds like a lot of fun. And every summer you guys were doing Edge Fest. How did those start? You see, for the CFMY 10th anniversary, we had a special event at Molson Park in Barrie mm-hmm. where tickets sold for a dollar and two cents. Pretty much an all Canadian lineup, not quite, but mostly, and that turned out to be really successful. So every year on or about July first, we ended up having something at Molson Park. In '91, uh, we moved it to Ontario Place, the old Ontario Place Forum, and it was there for '91, '92. I can't remember what happened '93, '94. I think we were back at Molson Park, but then '95, the Molson Amphitheater opened. And we had three, no, four Edgefests that year. And then Edgefest went on sporadically at a variety of different places after that until it became very difficult to book the show because we didn't have a proper venue. You know, it did not work at the amphitheater. Yeah. Molson Park was gone. Uh, Downstreet Park was an opportunity, but it's run by three levels of government and it's really difficult. Then we ran into problems with. The value of the Canadian dollar, because when you do something like this, you need to pay in U.S. dollars. And then there was just too much competition with all the festivals that popped up, especially in the U.K. and Europe. It was just too hard to get bands to alter their touring schedule to play one show in Canada and then duck back into the U.S. or back over the Atlantic. Yeah. So uh, as Edgefest had a really good run. I think the last one was 2008, I think. And it's just been... The concert industry has just changed too much for it to be something that we can do. We went to probably 2000 to 2005 or so, like all the ones right up until Molson Park closed because I lived north of Barrie. That was was a fantastic rite of passage going to those shows every July. Yeah, it was. And we look forward to it so much, even with all the traffic and all the hassles. We really, really did. But what are you going to do? It's, it's you know, everything changes. And that was before we had mega festivals like Bonnaroo and Coachella and, and uh, even Lollapalooza had to scale back because they used to be a touring thing. Now they just play in Chicago once a year. They're going to. I have really fond memories of those Ed's Fest shows. Cause oh, yeah. Somersault when that was Yeah, on. Somersault, another roadside attraction, Lilith Fair. Uh, there was a lot of those shows, a lot of those touring festivals in the 90s. A lot. And kid went no music in his town. It was like something you could get to yep. and see 20 acts in the day. It was, and, and hang out with people just like you. Yeah, exactly. It was always special when someone drove another four hours past where you came from. And you're like, wow, yeah. that's, that's dedication. Early 2000s, you also left the Edge for a while and you went I was to transferred. Hamilton. Oh, okay. Transferred. I was, uh, you know, had been doing afternoons on the Edge for quite some time. And I was, okay, it's time to take the next career leap. I would like to be a program director. So they called my bluff and they put me into Y95 in Hamilton. And one of the first things I had to oversee was the switching of the station's frequencies from Y95 to Y108. Mm -hmm. So I was there for a couple of years learning how to be, uh, three years actually, learning how to be a program director. Then there was a shuffle at the management level and that brought me back to the edge where I was the PD here for five years. And after that, I went to join a newly created online division where we're trying to figure out exactly where music was going, you know, with the internet and how to integrate that with the radio. Uh, that lasted a couple of years and then they decided that, no, we're going to just fold that division. So thanks for your service. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> yeah. So after I was three months short, three months short of my 25th anniversary with the, with the company, uh, I was let go. So I spent sort of three years on a walkabout. And one of the things I did during that time was help put Indy 88 on the air. In fact, oh, really? I was the first voice to be broadcast on Indy 88 when it uh, started broadcasting. 
That I did not come across. So I was I consulted with them. I was sort of on their their you know management team for for a while. And then one day, out of the blue, without even expecting it, I uh, got a call from the same people who let me go three years earlier, saying, "Would you like to come back?" <laughs> and they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And uh, that was 2014, and I'm still here. In your little walkabout, you joined Rock 95 for a little bit. Is that true? Well, Rock 95 was the ownership of Indie 88. Oh, okay. So that's how Central Ontario Broadcasting. So they owned Indie 88. So I didn't do anything at Rock 95, but indirectly I would talk to the owner. Well, I was hired by the owner of, of those two stations. Again, that was that was the one that came in clear in my yes. my youth. So it was when I saw that, I was like, I don't ever remember. Never anymore. on the station. <laughs> yeah. Never on the station. Okay. That's interesting with the Indy 88, which is now they're a competitor, right? Yeah. Is there a little part of you of watching them? Yeah, I'm, I'm always watching them because it's, it's, I think they're a very healthy thing for the Toronto radio market. It brings more people into the radio audience, people who may have drifted away for whatever reason. So they made the pie bigger. Great. Fantastic. And it keeps everybody else sharp. Yeah. Healthy competition. Healthy competition. That's, That's a good, good. Thing to have. How's your drumming these days? You still drumming? Uh, I no, the kit is uh, is still in storage. Uh, I did earlier this year buy myself an electronic kit, but it uh, I haven't spent as much time as I wanted to with it over the last number of months because of the kidney stone health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it kind of hard to sit down on a drum throne, um, and it drives the dogs nuts. But uh, eh, I'll get into it over the winter. So. You've always wanted to be on the radio. How does it feel to be such a figurehead or a voice well, that everyone I talk to you about doing this, they're like, oh my God, I love his voice. <laughs> it's such a distinct voice and you have held such a, a role in just influencing back before that was a job and just <laughs> educating people on like the little tidbits uh, about listen, fans that I, people I'm, didn't I, know. I can't believe I'm still doing this. I mean, I'm doing this 38 years. Uh, what's the date today? Oh, shit. I missed the anniversary. November 13th. Oh, wow. Would have been the 38th year since I started uh, at that radio station in Selkirk, Manitoba. And I have no idea. A lot of other people have uh, that I've worked with over the years have, have left the business or been asked to leave the business or died. Um, I'm just happy to still be here. Um, I never look back. Um, I always look forward. I'm always interested in what's next. Certainly, I'm not interested in coasting. I always want to keep moving forward because uh, it's just more fun that way. As a listener, it's um, very apparent the just your passion for music and for uncovering these little tidbits that people don't know and like yourself professed as a geek of music. I wonder, was that always there? Yeah. I mean, I'm a history major. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, which is how I ended up doing the program in the first place. It was assigned to me. I didn't choose to do it. I didn't invent it. It was assigned to me. and But I've you know, there's no glory in telling the same stories, regurgitating the same information. Knowledge is power. Tell me something I don't know. Tell me something that I can go to my friend and impress them so they'll think I'm a music powerhouse. So, yeah, that's that's... Think about it this way. Um, I've been doing this for a very, very long time. So I've been there, done that, seen a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for things to make me go, wow, that's cool. Okay? And if I can make me react that way, somebody with all this baggage and experience, imagine how it's going to have, what kind of an effect it's going to have on somebody who has a life. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's what I'm always striving for finding out things telling stories that are either seldom told or have never been told and another great thing that you've been doing it i've been going back through them in like the podcast form but um in their own words when you're when you get the band in together and you get them to tell their stories like as an interviewer you're you're fantastic recently you, you met with ringo yep um have you ever done paul i did at a press conference Okay. It wasn't a one-on-one -on -one so thing. George, back in the day? Maybe? No, I, just the two. Just the two Beatles. I know you've done Liam and Noel separately, but yeah. did you ever do them together? Don't think so. I was in the room once when they were back in, I think, 94, when the band was being interviewed, when they played Lee's Palace Okay. for their first Canadian show. But that was it. 
as a music journalist, how can you not love Oasis? No, I agree. <laughs> They're always there for, you know, I will always accept an opportunity to talk to Liam Renault because you're always going to be entertained. What are some of the other standout people that you get in the room with and you're like, wow, you're one of my favorite bands? Yeah, uh, Bowie, anybody from U2, Eddie Vedder's interesting. Uh, Courtney Love is fascinating. Um, so wait, when, when did you talk with Bowie? Twice. 1990. And somewhere around 98, wow. somewhere around there, 98, 99, maybe a little bit later than that. I can't remember. Um, yeah, there's been so many. Um, Malcolm McLaren, uh, Stone Roses, Trent Reznor, Joe Strummer, uh, all the guys in Soundgarden, all the guys in Audio Slave, all the guys in R.E.M., Oasis, Charlatans. The only guy I never, oh, Foo Fighters, Beastie Boys. Queens of the Stone Age. The only guy I never got to talk to was Kurt. Yeah. Yeah, it just never, never worked out. They came here. First show that they played in Toronto, I think, was at Lee's Palace. And that was still before Dave joined the band. Uh, then the next time they came through, they were at Maple Leaf Gardens and the biggest thing in the world. And there was just nothing in between. They played in Molson Park too, didn't they? I think so. I remember seeing that, but I, I think I was nine or something. I, I, I you know, I, I can't, I, I can't be sure. But I, all I know is that I never got the opportunity. I mean, I've heard it more so when re-listening to your podcast. But the announcement when he came over the radio, yeah, like that, that was, was that was a big JFK moment. It really yeah. was. I remember thinking, "Don't screw this up." Lots of people are listening because, again, pre-internet. Where did you go to get the latest news? You went to the radio. Mm -hmm. and don't mess this up. I still remember that day. A lot of people do. A lot of people come and tell me that they were listening and they heard from me. You obviously didn't mess it up, but how does that make you feel when you hear that you being on the radio at that time or but that's why a multitude I, of other times? That's why I got into the radio, to be able to do that. That's what I wanted to be able to do. I wanted to be that voice from somewhere that told you something that you absolutely needed to know, whether you needed to know, whether you realized it or not. That's my job, mm -hmm. and I love my job. That is that six-year-old boy who yep. who picked up the radio. And Absolutely. So I may not be a newsman and anchor for foreign correspondent or, or reporter, but I'm still reporting, but just in a different way. And my whole goal is if you listen to me, I will tell you something that will make your life richer. And if I can't do that, then I've lost it. That's powerful. I think that's a good lesson for everybody. Yeah. You know, again, no glory in regurgitating information. Tell me something I don't know. Make my life richer in some way. I was just listening to Broken Record. Have you followed that at all? No. It's a podcast with uh, Malcolm Gladwell and Rick Rubin. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I just haven't listened okay, to it. Okay. So uh, Rick Rubin was talking to Adam Cohen about his dad, Leonard. They met up with Rick to like talk about producing a record and he said, well, we, I kind of want to bring you back to nylon strings and do old Leonard Cohen as it's kind of referred to. And he's just like, why would I go backwards? Mm -hmm. I think there's too much of that. Everyone wants to hear the piece that they cherish and uh, they're not necessarily able to uh, let go and grow with the artist. Yeah, that's the thing. Artists always want to grow, become better, experiment, try different things. So if you look at the Tragically Hip, for example, people will say, well, why couldn't they just continue to do songs like New Orleans is Sinking? Well, that's not what musicians do. Musicians grow and evolve, and they always want to stretch their abilities. So if you put a musician in a box like that, they're not going to do very well. They're going to suffocate and die. You see that where they get so big, they're controlled by the machine. Or they get lazy. Yeah. You know, there's lots of reasons why an artist will burn out. You know, they, they lose the ability to be creative. They start believing their own press. They burn out. They're pressured into doing something they don't want. Drugs, alcohol. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. The machine. Or the machine, yeah. So many people that. depend on them. Technology will change, and that'll ruin everything that you've been doing up until that point. You can't change with technology, you know. It's, it's, it's very, very, very difficult. You talk a lot about, like, streaming and the LP coming back. Um, where do you see music in the next five years going? Oh, if I knew, I would, I would implement that knowledge and become a billionaire. <laughs> I really don't know. 
We're in a really interesting period of transition when it comes to delivering music and consuming music. And what's after streaming? Is there anything after streaming? Um, is this idea of everybody being their own music director going to last or are people going to want more curation when it comes to music recommendations and so on? I don't know. I really don't know. Would you have ever foreseen people using cassettes again? People aren't using cassettes again. That's the thing. You know how many cassettes have been sold in this country entirely in this country since the beginning of the year? 6,600. <laughs> Big deal. You know how many CDs have been sold? About 4 million. Hmm. You know how many uh, albums have been sold? About 700,000. 6,600 doesn't count. Yeah, it's just uh, something to show off. So you keep going forward. Just one look back. What is it that you would tell that six-year-old through, you know, being in a wheat field, through Winnipeg? Hang in there. Don't let the bastards get you down. And don't be a dick. Those are the two things that will help more than any other through seeing your goals. Don't let the bastards get you down. And don't be a dick. Words to live by. All right, Alan. Thanks. Okay, thanks you're so very much. welcome. We're brand new in this podcast game, so please take the time and subscribe. Give us a like. Share us with your friends. Give us a review. All this helps with the algorithms. You know how the world runs these days. Nobody gets to choose. It's all what's put in front of us. And there are literally thousands of podcasts. So help us separate from the rest. And I will continue to bring great interviews like this. So stay tuned. Subscribe. And share the love. We'll be back next week. Thanks so much. Undeniable is a creation from Tomcast Industries. Theme music was created by Tony Malik.